Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Baka 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 Podcast. Baka 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 Baka. It's amazing how every time you open your mouth, you prove you're an idiot. Hello, everybody, and welcome to a very exciting new episode of Baka Baka Baka. Now, if this is your first time, we are an anime podcast. Every two weeks, we watch an anime, we come together, we discuss it like we're a book club. Is the closest thing I've ever in two years been able to think of, of to what we do. There has to be something better, but again, we are baka baka baka. <laughs> uh, I mean, we're, we're a year and a half, something like that. It's in that range. Shut up. I feel uh, old. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you are what you feel. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be like that, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> So we watched The Promised Neverland, uh, a very exciting anime from last season. It was a big hit, and we finally got around to watch it. I love when a new anime season ends, because that means the anime is now available for us to get to. We've been hearing all this chatter about it, and we have to kind of like avoid as much as we can so we can come at it fresh. Now we finally got to watch this anime, and so we are here to talk about it. Let me introduce my co-host to do that. First off, we have the Oliver Twist to my Fagin, Jeremy. How you doing, man? I'm trying to figure that one out. Why do you come up with the weirdest crap? <laughs> how is that? How is that weird? Like, like I get the orphan Chris. boy. I, I get the all, a little orphan Fagin boy. Fagin was was the criminal character in. Oh, uh, I didn't know his name. Me neither. I googled it. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm not even sure I pronounced it right. But how it's are gonna, you? There's gonna be that one guy in the comments that's gonna yell at us. Like, how do you not yeah, know exactly. this? <laughs> yeah. And why do you care? Um, yeah, speaking I'm of book club, good. don't don't know book name. I know, I know, right? We don't even know how to use book club right because we're watching a visual media. <laughs> um, I'm doing pretty good. Um, I've actually been watching a, a handful of YouTube videos uh, when I get the opportunity. Found a really cool channel, uh, Chris oh Ramsey. No, it's actually really cool this time. Chris Ramsey, he's a magician that does like puzzle boxes and stuff. And he's got some really interesting ones. He does them way faster than I know I would be able to. It'd be probably days. He does them in like a couple hours or sometimes half an hour. Really, really cool. Fun I, to ap- watch. I apologize. That is cool. That is cool. That's right. <laughs> my, my favorite videos you've been sending us lately was the uh, origin of bunnies and their oh, God. Of history. RuneSmith. RuneSmith rocks, man. He is so a great. great channel. He's got some great D&D ones called like basically mind flares and basically celestials. And he has the same format where it's just kind of like this dry delivery and fantastic. Great channel. Another one. So two for one. There you go. My co-hosts have no understanding of free advertising. <laughs> <laughs> All right. My other co-host is the Annie to my daddy Warbucks. Jason, how are you? Hey, at least I'm a lot more famous. Um, <laughs> uh, depends on the crowd. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, anyways. Uh, terrible. Um, I have to have surgery <laughs> on my hand. Oh, so that's 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 pretty great. I have a ganglion cyst that's receded into the joint, and now it hurts to bend. Um, oh, and I have tendonitis in my left foot, so I'm in a boot for three weeks. And then I rolled my right ankle today, and it hurts like crazy. So, oh my god! So are you, we need to get like, you in like a bed cast. Yeah, right? can you, <laughs> you, you you probably can't crutch with the wrist thing. So are you wheelchair bound right now? Or <laughs> thank God um, it's the left wrist, right? Because like, how would you path of exile? Well, I'm so glad that's the direction you went. <laughs> I, I'm scared. Um, <laughs> uh, so with walking, the tendonitis is in the top tendons of my foot, so I just have to make sure that it's this. So I can uh, weight bearing is not a problem. So now I normal walk in my boot, but then limp on my right leg. <laughs> Oh my god! So, I'm Fine. so broken. Fine. Oh man! And my name is Troy. <laughs> I got to see the Detective Pikachu movie. Yes, you actually saw it already. I went and saw it. You know, I I took my my seniors, twin daughters. You know, this might be the last movie I ever get to take them to, like as a family. Uh, and they are Pokemon freaks. Now I watched the anime. For a couple of seasons, I played Gen 1 games, and, and I've dabbled every every once in a while. I played some Pokemon Go. So I know Pokemon, but they are freaks. They play every single game. They've watched every oh. single season. They know all the movies. Do they so play, this, like, when, when Shield comes out in Sword, are they going to play both? Yep. Like, 
Oh yep. my gosh. Well, they're, they're twins. They'll buy one of each oh, and, then and then swap just track them on. Yeah. Gotcha. So <laughs> Detective Pikachu is not new, right? This is a retelling? Detective Pikachu was a 3DS game. I have no idea if the movie is, has anything to do with the story in the game. I, I wouldn't think it did. This is kind of its own story, just set in the Pokemon world. And there is a guy who can understand a Pikachu who thinks he's a detective. Pika, pika. Um, story wise, it's kind of a mess. Mm. Uh, if you're not a huge Pokemon guy or you don't have like family, you know, kids that are huge Pokemon guys, it's probably a rental. It is a fun family fi- film. It is a family film. It's not a deep plot. But guys, as a film buff and Pokemon fan, this movie made some weird choices. They took the stuff that about Pokemon that's weird. And instead of like hiding it so they could appeal to mass audiences, they put it on display for everyone to see. The, <laughs> think that. about the Mr. Mime in yeah. the trailer scene. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That stuff everywhere. Oh, I like that. Uh, speaking of the trailer, uh, it, the context that seems to be happening with Pikachu in the bar, or not Pikachu, but uh, Jigglypuff, it, is that like, what it seems it is? To sleep? That you go there and he sings you to sleep. <laughs> Spoiler and, territory. And what, steals your money? <laughs> they never elaborate. They, you see them oh. multiple times. Uh, also, I, I won't spoil which one, but my favorite starter, the one who I always thought was underappreciated, Gen 1, uh, gets a huge moment. And I said going into this movie, man, I really hope they give my starter a cool scene. And they did. And I, I fist pumped in the theater. And people looked at you weird. Also, for those who have seen it, there's a Home Alone Easter egg in there that blew my mind. I was more excited for that Easter egg about Home Alone than the rest of the movie, even though the rest of the movie was crazy. Wow. Also, out. it's it's also kind of scary, dark, like Roger Rabbit was back in the 90s. Like, really? Just, like there's stuff that's as you're like, you'll, the, your kids are going to grow up and be like, man, that was freaky. I can't believe I love this movie. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's exactly that, how I think of that movie. <laughs> that's that's in this movie again. So as as a Pokemon fan, as as a film buff, I loved it. It is not a perfect movie. For most people, it's probably a rental. What do you think of Sonic? The trailer. You know what I think of Sonic the trailer. I think what they could do to fix it is if they actually did the same thing as you said they do with Pokemon, like embrace the weirdness have like the little animals that come out of the the robotic stuff things like that i, I agree but from the trailer it looks like they're they're like okay man we'll put them in the real world so people yeah. like, people aren't confused and like make dr robotnik just a kind of eccentric scientist or, or dr eggman yeah. for younger audiences or japanese audiences um yeah okay, i wanted we- i wanted sally <laughs> <laughs> or knuckles I wanted Ugandan knuckles in it. Yeah, where's Tails? Oh, it's Ugandan knuckles. <laughs> don't, don't mention Princess Sally around me because I'll fall back in love. Oh, oh no. Okay, this got weird again. <laughs> that character uh, almost made me hurry. Let's move on to this anime. Not- <laughs> <laughs> the Promise Neverland. So let's give our non spoiler reviews. Jason, you picked it. What'd you think? Uh, I thought it was fantastic. Um, this has all the psychological horror that I was really looking forward to in an anime. And I like that in the very first episode, they let you know that nobody's safe. Like we are going full bore. There's no plot armor here. Uh, and it, it brings the tension up really, really well. Um, yeah, this is, this is a must watch for this season's anime. Okay. Jeremy, how about you? Completely agree. Absolutely loved it. Um, I love the chess game. There's like this back and forth chess game between characters because we are dealing with equally capable between the heroes and the villains, if you want to use those terms. And and absolutely loved it. Great. Great to watch. Yeah, it gave me Death Note feels. It, 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 you know, it's its own story. It's its own thing, but it's very much. I know that you know that I know, and we're all holding our cards to our chest, but this is a life and death game we are playing, and it it hooks you and you hold on to every second. Um, I kept thinking about what um 
Hitchcock said about suspense that if you film a, a scene and you have people having a conversation at a meal and then a bomb goes off, you've scared your audience. That's giving them a scare. But if you tell the audience that before the scene, there's a bomb in the restaurant while the two people have a conversation, that same conversation is now completely different to the audience. And that's what this does. This tells you there is a bomb waiting to go off in every conversation. It is weighted down now because of that suspense. It is fantastic. Yeah. If I could add one more thing before we get into spoiler territory, I was a little bit worried that they might go in the direction of like gore, horror, gore, scare you know, and really capitalize on the fact that they're dealing with children. They don't go anywhere near that. Mm -hmm. That is not the kind of horror or suspense that this is. Which was a brilliant choice, by the way. Yeah, completely. And and even especially the main characters, even though they are children, they are not treated as children. Like because of the situation, they are presented as adult minds handling an adult situation. And you never, you know, we've watched anime where like helpless children were, killed in the past and we all really were upset by it you there's not that sense here at all Mm -hmm. yep okay so the op and the the ending what do you guys think of the the themes um i've been playing the music for the theme the op uh basically non-stop for a week uh yeah, the, the the band is fantastic, but I also love the visuals. And one thing we got to like, I got to say, like, right off the bat, the animation, at least the budget for this particular anime was mind blowing. Like, it reminds me of the great fight scenes of uh, uh, One Punch Man or the beautiful aesthetics of uh, Evergarden. Like, they animated the piss out of this. It was it was amazing. Yeah, I liked it. It was really good. Um, I liked the first outro more than I liked the second one because I think it switches about halfway through. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I like the second one better, but the the intro stayed great all the way through. Yeah, I, I agree with that. The, the outros I liked with the intro. My wife actually sat down and watched some episodes with me. My daughter and me watched this whole thing together and we've been singing. We've been arguing whether it's na, 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 na or no, 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 no. Yeah, uh, but we 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 love the song. We were literally singing it tonight as I was setting up to record the podcast. Wow! Yeah, it's still playing through the house. Okay, so now we're going to our spoiler section, um, and I especially want to say this is airing at the time of recording on Adult Swim, and there you're definitely not at the end yet. So if if you're coming here looking for some cool stuff to talk about this this anime we are going to ruin the ending so if you have not finished the series and you're you're following along with adult swim at the time when this podcast releases please stop now please (laughs) come back Mm -hmm. uh you know when when adult swim finishes you know we'll still be here we probably are hard to find and and i understand if you can't come back (laughs) you will probably regret if you spoil it yeah try not to highly recommend not spoiling this one but Mm -hmm. we are going forward with spoiler one with that said, I had to talk about the OP for a second again. <laughs> now that it's because the OP has a major spoiler in it. About halfway through the anime, I turned to my daughter and said, I know how this is going to happen. She goes, how do you know? And I'm like, the OP has been telling us the entire time. <laughs> it's on what fire. What did you see? It's on fire. They keep saying oh, it's on fire. Yeah. yeah. When that scene happened, I was like, oh, this is the reference from the OP. <laughs> been oh, saying it's on okay. fire. And, and there's been, you know, a fuse lit and, and yeah. um, reference to fire. Yeah. Um, so I did guess fire was coming, but we'll get to that. We will get to that. <laughs> I, it, it, bef- yeah, not to spoil too much. I'm actually really curious how Norman knew about the setting of fire. Like, how did he how did he know do Ray you, was going to do that? Do you remember the scene where um when I, he wasn't sure about whether Ray was believable or not and so he pulled his bed away from the wall when Ray wasn't in the room and we didn't get to see what he saw but he got this softened expression and was like oh that's Oh, do you think he plan. saw canisters of yep. kerosene? Oh, yep. okay. He yeah. saw Ray he saw Ray's stash. Okay. No, honestly, there's a lot when I was going back through my notes, there would be something I'd notice in my notes and be like, "Oh my gosh, they totally gave us that clue." Yeah, yeah so many totally layers. Did. So yeah. many layers. Yeah, yeah, great. Okay. Yeah, let's get into it. Let's get into it. <laughs> um, we get a quick scene with three children visiting a 
it's like a little fence. But then we go into story properly. We come, we're in an orphanage with 38 children. We meet, you know, at them as they're waking up. But the, one of the big characters we meet is Mama. Mama Isabel. Um, and I'm going to start with her because she is probably one of the most important characters, even though she's also the villain. And we have a lot to say about her. So, guys, Mama Isabel, our villain, our mom character, what would you think? She, She's my favorite character in this entire anime, but she's my new favorite villain, especially of this season. Um, and I think that it, it, it's, it's the psychological mind game she's able to play with this facade of absolute cherishment and love for these kids uh, and come to find out she really does like love these kids as if they were her own. Um, but unfortunately it becomes a very twisted way, but in all the ways that count on a day to day life basis, she loves them more than any other uh, like orphanage uh, steward would. Right. Um, it, it, she loves them as her own. Unfortunately, it's it's a vile, twisted version. <laughs> but to these kids, until what happens in the end of this episode happens, they're living an amazing life as orphans. Like it's hard to believe this is an orphanage. How well everyone is treated. Yeah, there were uh, there were points in time where I was genuinely suspicious that maybe mother had some some good intention. Like maybe she was actually ultimately trying to help them escape, but didn't want to reveal her own involvement in it. And of course that's not what winds up happening. And I absolutely love the fact that she was essentially, um, you know how we talk about the best villains are villains where you can completely understand where they're coming from and why they're making the decisions. It doesn't mean you necessarily agree with it, but you can understand it. And she's basically somebody who has been completely indoctrinated and believes that, you know, there is no escape. And so she's just going to love them as long as they can survive. Make sure that every moment of their life is full of joy and happiness and love and care because they don't have any way out in her mind. And this is the absolute best that they can be given. And that made her really fascinating like you were saying um so I, I love this character great character there's so many layers of control for these kids in this orphanage once they find out what's going on and the way mama plays into that the way she knows that they're how layered they are and it, oh you, you broke past this layer <laughs> then you're gonna run in this layer and she allows that to happen for this slow breakdown of will for ultimate control. And, and and it comes to a pivotal scene where she's like, literally, I control you. You don't get to leave. <laughs> you need to stop or it will kill you. Um, she, And like, like you said, it's done out of love, but also a pride in her work of turning over her good yeah. product. Yes. Um, it, it's, it's really twisted. Um, but she and she, they for most of the anime, they play it very close to the vest. She, she's always just kind of one step ahead and, you know, watching a lot of watching. It's interesting that you mentioned the control part because there's and I didn't really notice it until uh, they mentioned it. I think in episode six or seven, she is literally 80 percent of the time holding one of the little ones. Mm. Mm -hmm. There will be scene after scene where you see a couple people together together and she's in the background just watching. And if you're not paying attention, you'll miss her. But if you do look at her, it's nearly menacing, even though she has like a half smile on her face. <laughs> um, the Yeah, she's animated beautifully, but the layers. And I think what happened is a long time ago, she made the choice that she was going to survive by any means necessary, mm -hmm. which turned into this. Uh, I'm going to deliver the highest level product that I can. Um, and, and because it, 
even though these kids think they're just amazingly smart, it, she passed those bars as well to be, get to where she was. Uh, and she's been there. She was them. So it, it, it's going to be, it's very tough for them to outwit her. Yeah. Um, okay. So after we move on, we also get to meet our three main characters. So we'll go through them as well as they go start kind of their daily life in this really rustic farmland orphanage, but with like high tech desk for testing. Like there's yeah. just this hint of futurism in it, but every, they, like they're using oil lanterns, you know, it, it's, it's got a really original flavor of world feel for it. Yeah. It's almost like you have the technology as the core and then it's, that's wrapped by the facade of, like you were saying, this, Right. Villa out in the middle of nowhere. So let's start with Emma six three one nine four three. You wrote the numbers down. <laughs> Actually, I'm pretty sure my daughter did. I don't think I wrote these down. Now oh, I nice. did notice the numbers for the episode titles are the dates of uh, that the episode ends on, but I can't really figure out what their numbers mean. I are because they're very similarly formatted to the date numbers that we well, usually see. I was really confused because um, I saw you mention that in the chat that it was the dates, but I really thought there was a point in the first episode or the second episode where they mentioned something about the year 2000 something. They did, but, but okay. So like this first episode is 12, 10, uh -huh. 45. So that would be the 12th of October in something 45. So you're thinking it's 2045, 2245, 2525. Like it could literally be anything. Uh -huh. Um, I just uh, thought it was 1945 because of the parts that he was requesting from the outside world. And, like and for stuff. for American audiences, we put month, day, uh, day, year, but everywhere else is smart enough to go day, <laughs> month, year. So the number that changes is those first two digits as the days roll through. And then every once in a while, the month will roll too. But mm. this is all happening in that 45 year. So what was the uh, on the neck? So the, her number is six three one nine four three. So uh, that doesn't make sense as far as a date. No, because um, that would be either two years ago or yeah. I don't know. Well, there's no sixty third day of the month, right? I, I, I'm aware. <laughs> <laughs> so it'd be like six slash three slash nineteen forty three, which again doesn't make sense. No. Yeah, not for the level of technology they have. But uh -huh. but the font matches. So I, I had uh, my daughter had a theory that it was dates. And we looked at it. And I was like, I, I cannot figure out a way that fits. But I did want to list out the date. I'm sure somebody knows. What is the um, facility number? Is this number three, four? Or this six? is farm three. This is farm three. OK. Um, I wonder. I, I mean, the first thing that I thought of when I saw this, because uh, before we decided to watch this, I watched the first two episodes when it first started airing. Um, just cause I I've been looking forward to this one. Uh, the first thing that I thought of when I saw those numbers was, Oh, they're cattle. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's like an ear tag. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Ear tag, a brand, you know, uh -huh. right. Right. Um, so guys, what did you think of the character Emma? I thought she was fantastic. Um, it, I, I think one of the great things about the storytelling uh, which kind of leads into all three of these characters is we get very little um, deposition as far as who they are, uh, but they tell in showing what they can do, showing how they act and uh, what, uh, what decisions they make in a particular situation. I love her not just outgoingness and willingness to do the impossible, but also her ever love, ever loving um, optimism. Mm -hmm. Like she, she will see optimism in the most dire situations. The refusal to give up. In yes. Character is, is amazing and how it plays through as a theme. Mm -hmm. I have a love hate relationship with characters of her archetype. And I think what made me like her as a character, as opposed to just giving into the hatred of naive characters that are super idealistic and are like, no, we have to do it perfectly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I usually 
really, really, really have a hard time with that. But this anime owned it. Like they called her out on it again and again mm-hmm. and again. And people are always telling her like, your weakness is that you're naive. Your weakness is that you're so concerned with helping others that you will let yourself die on that hill. And because the anime was willing to acknowledge that, I was like, okay, then you understand this building block and you're not going to use it as a magical building block to just solve problems, you know, with, with willpower. In the end, you're going to provide some kind of reason for why, if she succeeds, it could succeed. To build off that, the thing I love about Emma the most, along with everything we've already said, is that, you know, we have Ray and Norman, who are both geniuses, and we're about to talk about them too. But Ray, his his intellect is like direct. He finds the direct, obvious, realistic path and plans for it. Norman is playing 4D chess. He's thinking 300 moves ahead of you. But Emma's optimism and naivety is the only thing that outsmarts yep. Mama because she can't fathom it. <laughs> yes. Every plan that ended up working was because was part of Emma's plan. And I love that. That and it wasn't because it's a good plan. It was just because Mama couldn't think like that. And so it it was something outside of her range of thought. Whereas Norman and Ray, she's also right up there with them and like t- doing counter moves and, and ahead of them. Mm-hmm. But Emma, she can't keep up with because that's not how she thinks. Is not the most effective path. And she's expecting the most effective because that's what they're like. All these kids are being trained to be the most effective, right? Like nine seconds, you have nine seconds per question, you know, and and being idealistic is not going to be the most effective by definition. So, yeah, I I love I love how that optimism forces Norman into really not just uncomfortable, but really desperate situations and planning. Like, how do I make this work? Because I do not want to see her cry. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I I didn't even realize it once it finished. It was like, it was actually the day before we recorded this. I was just sitting down like, man, everything that ended up working that, that mama couldn't figure out came from Emma despite her not being the tactical genius. And actually I was a little worried because most of the anime, we don't see Emma doing much in planning. She doesn't have as much contributions. We see Ray and Norman constantly thinking up new stuff. And it's like, Oh, Emma is the physical one. I guess, I guess we'll see that eventually. Um, But it ended up going a different way. I loved it. Yeah, it was really cool. Okay. Now Ray, who is the black haired orphan boy, like I said, he's the direct, you know, the most efficient way and the real realist of the group. what do you guys think of him? Uh, I thought he was a great compliment um, because, you know, he's not quite at Norman's level, uh, but he kind of sees things for what they are. Um, and he can extrapolate uh, very quickly. And it, it's funny though, because I think he's been playing a long game for a yeah. long time. Um, and, and that's the thing is he's willing, not only does he's, direct and let's take the path that is you know most likely to work uh but he 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 plays like five different long games all at the same time and he's able to keep track of all of them um and at first i kind of didn't like him just because he was uh you know he was the typical outcast character that's really smart and da da da. but then also you realize oh he's been reading books this whole time but he hates reading (laughs) yeah (laughs) um you know, and we find out about his relationship with Mama and that he has that ability, not ability, but like uh, apparently the infant amnesia he just didn't get, which most people do, mm-hmm. uh, which added just a whole nother layer to him. Um, yeah, I, I actually ended up really, really endeared to this character. Yeah, this was my favorite character. Um, and it's probably because... I most identified with his approach to <laughs> the problems. Like this is the most effective. Yes, this makes sense. Sure. That's wonderful. That's an idealistic approach. And you, you, yeah, you want to do that, but then we're all going to die. And I don't want you to die. I don't want to die. I don't want you to die. We're going to do this this way. Even to the point where he's like trying to force Norman to, <laughs> to backstab her. I'm like, I totally get that. That makes sense. I, I understand this tactic. This is, this is very interesting. Um, when I learned about the infantile amnesia that he didn't have, um, that 
added a huge layer to his character for me because this changes everything. It means that Normand is a, is a genius. Norman is just a genius. Uh, Emma is perhaps, I don't know what the appropriate word would, would be other than genius, but she's, she's up there with Norman. Ray had to cultivate this through study and remembering everything. And that to me is absolutely fascinating because it means that this whole time, well, the other two were, you know, they were succeeding and, and I'm sure that they put some effort into it. This but but it's like, their natural oh, talent. It's Whereas their natural talent with, with him. It's like, I'm going to get perfect scores so that I stay alive. I know that's what's necessary. I'm going to keep doing it. doesn't matter how hard I have to work. I will remember this. It was that in a way that was willpower triumphing over the circumstance as much as any of the other times you see it in anime. And that was really fascinating to me. Um, yeah. I, I saw Ray the first time and I was like, man, Jeremy's going to love this guy. <laughs> yeah, I love that character. <laughs> that, was, that was my first thought. Like, like a guy who's like, yeah, I want to survive, but here's a realism uh, to it. But what I really loved about it was that, you know, this anime sets up, you know, the kids versus the the system, the, the, the demons, mama. But instead it starts breaking it down into factions. So there's Norman and Ray who want very similar goals, but they are different goals. So they're also playing against each other while trying to work together. And then we're also going to get another, a, a sister who comes to the house. And so that that's a whole nother. So there's actually like four people all trying to out strategize each other with sometimes sharing goals and sometimes not sharing goals. I love how multi-layered and faceted it got. And Ray is one of the best examples of it. Okay, and then last but not least, uh, the beautiful albino boy, Al <laughs> Norman. What do you guys think of him? Uh, it, it breaks my heart. Um, yeah, <laughs> I again just love this character, uh, and and just like you said, he is playing 4D chess with ten different people while being in this anime, <laughs> and he's uh, he's so far ahead of all the others but what's scary is no matter how how many plans he was coming up with and how many ways he was able to achieve some of his goals it seemed like mama was always just one step ahead of him or at least was aware of what he was doing um which it speaks to mama's intelligence as well but um yeah i i think what really endeared me to him is it <sighs> What was great about this anime is you didn't get the I'm not sure if you can call it love interest because they were only, what, 12. But he said he liked Emma in, in, and it seemed like it was more of a friend more than just I like her as friendship. And that was so uh, it, you could almost call that a weakness for him because it did hold him back from the reasonability that Ray was trying to present to him. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I think that gave me a soft spot for him because he's like, I'm going to use all my abilities to try to make this girl's wish come true because I like her and I don't want to see her cry. Um, and, and yeah, so his, his, his maneuvering of everything in this anime was really, really fascinating to watch. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it was really interesting. It almost, it's almost like I would, I would rather see her die than see her cry, <laughs> basically. But I, I do completely agree. Uh, there was, I think, some of the best scenes. Now, my absolute favorite scene is right at the end. And this is not one of it, it. None of these are that scene. But some of my favorite scenes are the moments when Norman realizes that his plan has been predicted by mom. Mm -hmm. And the way his eyes shift to deal with, you know, oh, crap. You know, everything just fell apart in my head and I have to completely reassemble it all, taking into account all of these different things. Beautiful. In a very short so amount well of time. Done. Yeah, like immediately. Um, so, so well done. I don't think, um, yeah, I'll leave that for later. We'll spoil it as we get to it. It'll be more Im impactful that way, but I think it's a good call. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, I really like, I really like Norman and yeah. Yeah. I absolutely agree with what you guys are saying about Norman. I, I especially what, what Jason was saying, the, the fact that he is the smartest of the three, 
but that he's not detached from his emotion and is like, I know this isn't the best choice, but I love her. <laughs> you know, I know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to do this for her, even though that's not the way it's going to work. Even though he, like he's having dreams yes. of failing and Ray dying next to him being like, this is what I was trying to tell you. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Um, So, so good. And then to build on what Jeremy was saying, the way they draw despair and weariness on the faces in this anime is just heart wrenching. Like, oh, you poor kid. That's so rough. But, just those so many lines just destroying their face. <laughs> but you feel the tension and anguish yeah. with them. Yeah, you do. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like you said, every time that he's like, okay, we plan for this, this, this. And then he's like, oh, there's another level of control I didn't know about. <laughs> we can't uh-huh. beat it. Oh, man, it was rough. Okay. Uh, we'll jump back into the story now. Uh, we see the kids playing tag, which I th- think is a beautiful, great way to start this anime because not only will tag feature heavily into the plot, but we also get to see their personalities. We see Norman is the, the guy who's it and he can just take out all these kids. He not only is he physically capable, but he can outsmart everyone. The only one he can't catch is Emma because she's more physically capable than him, but he can exploit her weakness and defeat her easily. Meanwhile, Ray just sits back and reads the whole time explaining to others why they lost. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So, so not only do we get in this first episode, really good, solid character profiles. We're also given, Hey, these guys play tag a lot. It's really important. <laughs> which is a normal thing for the kids this age to be doing. Right. Which would fit well, especially in you know, like in a world without you know, phones, television and stuff. Of course they're outside playing games and, and yeah. fully exploring this property. Um, mm-hmm. We do see a fence line, which is just like this, like two foot high metal bar with slats that, you know, that they could just step over really. And they're like, we're told never to go past this. And, and this, this is a beautiful foreshadowing of everything. Like, this thing that's totally passable, <laughs> that's not the real thing keeping you back. Um, yeah, it almost seemed like this was there to provide a way for them to feel like they're breaking a rule that mattered without actually making any progress toward escape. <laughs> right. Which it keeps happening, doesn't it? Yep. Um, but then we come to the character of Connie. My daughter, like, why didn't you highlight Connie to talk about? Well, honey, Connie doesn't get a whole lot of character development. <laughs> or screen time. Yeah. Uh, so so basically, this child has been given, chosen for adoption. And she says her goodbyes. And she does that. I promised to write letters. And I was like, yeah, no one ever writes the letters they promised to write. But and Connie's like, no, I will. And she's got her little bunny. And she's getting ready to go. And she, oh, leaves, with, she leaves with mama out into the night to go get adopted. And Norman and Emma realize she left her bunny behind and they take the bunny and they run after her. Now, one thing I didn't catch until later when they talk about it Ray, is Ray's, the one who... Ray's like, oh, no, it, you, if you run now, you could probably catch him. This was deliberate. <laughs> yep. Again, layers on layers. Like you, what you think you saw isn't what you think you actually saw. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah, so they run out into the night. They run to the gatehouse. There's a truck there, but they can't find her. And eventually they look into the back of the truck and she's dead. With a flower sticking. With a flower sticking out of her chest. What is it? Do they eat the flower? I don't think so. No, I think the flower just like puts them into some kind of stasis or something. It, uh, so all the times we see it happen, it as it drains the blood from the body the flowers bloom right i think it's a means of bleeding the cattle you think it pulls all the blood out yes Uh, i mean she's she's dead i don't think she's in that like catatonic she's dead but she's gray like gray gray and the same thing happens to sister crone oh spoiler um (laughs) but like the color pulls out of her skin as the flower blooms I, I think it never occurred to me that it would have been able to draw all the blood out, but you could be right. I, I have a feeling that's exactly what it's for is instead of like with cattle, you know, you string them up, they, mm-hmm. they use this flower. 
So yeah, basically their world comes crashing down as they realize they are not living in an orphanage. They are living on a ranch. They are cattle. They are food. And and two demons even come out like, oh, let's just eat her finger. It'll be so good. I'm so hungry. Um, and, and they hide. And mother is there. And they end up they they get they they get away and run back to the house, but they forget the bunny which Mama finds. Oh God. The look mm. on mom's face. Mm. And so the game is afoot. Mama is aware that somebody knows that somebody has discovered the secret and that it has to be dealt with. The kids now know that they are not safe <laughs> and death is imminent. Um, yeah. Then these 11 year olds. Uh, I mean, if you, this anime is the kind of anime I would show people to teach them how great anime can be. There's yeah. no. Robots and bouncing boobs and all the, the the weird stuff we love, yeah, we but, do. But turn off regular yeah. audiences from anime. But this is like, you want to see something? I, I explained this to to Mark, who was who was on the show. I was like, hey, we're watching this new anime. And this is what it's about. He's like, who thinks of this? And I'm like, Japan. Japan yeah. <laughs> always thinks of this. Have you seen their game shows? <laughs> yes, <gasps> so good. Um, so in the next episode, we see Emma struggling to act normal. You know, her and Norman are talking about this and they're trying to figure out what they can figure out. They they realize it's about test scores and that there won't be another shipment for about two months because they're like, OK, so there's usually adoption every two months. So they have some time. They also um, figure out the age range that they're willing to send somebody mm-hmm. and that the uh, Intel or the test scores relate to how early they'll send somebody. Right. The smarter you are, the longer they'll let you stay. Um, basically becoming more tasty prime, you know, <laughs> great a prime brain, brain rib. Yeah. <laughs> Kobe brain. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they then do go over that little fence and they find a giant wall, um, this big white wall that just runs from end to end. And then when they return, one of the little kids um, gets lost and Mama pulls out her pocket watch and opens it up and is able to locate her. And Norman realizes, oh, she has tracking devices on us. And B, she wants us to know she has tracking devices on us. <laughs> Mama, no fool. <laughs> that that realization there, I didn't catch it first. Yeah. And- that's fantastic layered storytelling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I thought I thought it was just like, oh, man, one of those moments where they just write it in the script that this thing happens that reveals this. But it was so much better when they revealed that it was an intentional event. Yeah, that wasn't for the audience. That was for yep. the kids. Yep. <laughs> so good. Uh, yeah. form Basically a form of intimidation. Uh huh. Yeah. So so mom is watching them closely and she comes upon Emma, who's kind of like having a freak out at one point. And she's like, you're so pale. And Emma manages to lie and hug her and be like, oh, I'm okay, Mama. I'm just sad that she, our, our sister's gone. How's she doing, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> this, oh, man. This scene, the, the the cat and mouse that's being played here is just fantastic. Because, mm-hmm. yeah, what is it? The scene cuts to... Emma and Mama and Mama's just leaning down like really close to her face with that look on her face. Like, uh-huh. hi. <laughs> just, and, I know it's and, you. and then like a couple scenes later, like Mama co- is talking to Norman and, and Emma. Or, and Emma might be the same scene. She's like, hey, have you guys been to the gatehouse lately? <laughs> and they're like, nope, nope. We got to go to dinner. Bye. <laughs> nope, nope. And then they go downstairs and they're just like freaking out. Um, again, the, that cat and mouse of uh, here's here's a here's a little bit of my card. I'm showing my card. Okay, no, pull back, pull back. Well, and and they even incorporate another player because Ray is the one that comes at that moment where, like, With as the, the audience, we're wondering what is going to happen. This is escalating really fast. This is getting really bad. It's obvious that she knows they were there at the gatehouse. They just showed their cards, and then you hear ding, 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 and you look over and it's Ray, and you're like, what does Ray know? <laughs> Which we then find out that the next day. Um, well, they decided to start building a rope to get over the wall and Ray shows up and he's like, yeah, I've, I know, I know everything. Um, mm-hmm. and he points out to them like, oh, you think you're just going to go over the wall and you're going to be done. Think about what's out there. If we're being kept in here, <laughs> like that's their world you're wanting to go out into. You need more than just getting over this wall. 
yeah, it, it made me think of if we had uh, it. W- what happens when horses or cattle escape out of their pens? Well, there's a whole society of humans, so <laughs> we're, we're like, hey, you that. should be in a pen, shouldn't you? <laughs> right. And <laughs> we better gather these things up. And it made a lot of sense too, because it takes you back to that first episode when they were little. Because we get a we get a little little moment of them being little little kids, and they're looking out and they're saying, "Hey, what do you want to do? Uh, yeah, get out and get adopted." And oh, I want to Ray- draft. Yeah, <laughs> and Ray's was, I want to survive. And I'm like, wow, that is hardcore, man. And then Lee realized he already knew. <laughs> uh, Ray, again, like we mentioned, Ray is, is like, okay, we can escape. And then was like, nope, we're all escaping. Um, and, and she Nor- argued this with Norman before. And so this is like the second time she's now arguing it. And then they come back and mom's like, hey, there's a new helper in the house. This is Sister Crone. What'd you guys think of Sister Crone? Terrifying. Absolutely <laughs> terrifying. Um, this was fantastic because, you know, as we learn later, Sister Crone and Mom, Mom Isabel, they both came from very similar circumstances, right? And they have a very similar baggage in how they were indoctrinated and how they got to this point. But they both handled that in very different ways. And it has had a, a toll on Crone where she has not been able to keep it together the way Isabel has. And it makes her terrifying. Her doll that she carries around from when she was a little girl and she still had like this little baby doll. It's not doing so well now. And it, it is a reflection of her psyche. And I absolutely loved that. She was it, absolutely terrifying. <laughs> it's just, yeah, Sister Crone is just broken but she doesn't show it in a despair or uh, she she's just (laughs) she keeps it together just enough to get through her day with the kids as just a a eccentric happy-go-lucky caretaker (laughs) but then in the quiet moments or when it's at night she's absolutely insane that this place has broken her mind um but she has ambition, which is interesting that she's she wants the end goal no matter the cost. Do and I think it's a big push from the survival instinct, right? Um but yeah, I I really enjoyed her addition to mm-hmm. this because we find out that she's not exactly on the same team as Mama, mm-hmm. but she kind of wants to be on that team, but she she knows that she she she's basically trying to usurp her from the moment she steps foot in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, like you guys were saying, she's she's wicked, she's wild, and just like with Ray, you know, here I thought they're like, hey, here's a new character, and they're stacking the deck for the bad guys, but no, she has her own agenda. She's her own team, and in some ways, that helps the you know she has goals that match the kids and she has goals that match mamas and and that's so good and and just like jeremy said her doll i saw it as like it was her childhood doll and that was what was left of her innocence and every time she got mad or frustrated or the more she got invested in this system she destroyed it (laughs) she's just tearing her own childhood self apart and then puts it back together. And it's just the weirdest, scariest looking thing. She is super creepy. But also in her final moments, which Jason already revealed, I felt sympathetic for her. Like, yeah, she's as much a victim as everybody else here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I thought it was absolutely fascinating, too. When you think about uh, we find out later that she and Isabel both went through these tests, just like the other kids that we have here. And they were perfect scores. And we get to see just how intelligent that makes them. Because when she shows up, Isabel hands her all of the files on these kids and says, I need you to memorize these. Is that going to be a problem? And Crone just basically flips through the pages and she's already memorized them. And that tells you how intelligent a perfect score is. So she's got that kind of intellect. And yet she has still been broken this hard. She couldn't think her way out of this situation. So in the story, um, they also get a new kid who moves into the orphanage. 
And so um, Emma checks her because they're worried about the tracker. They don't know how to figure it in the well. If there's a new kid, there might still be a mark where the tracker is, and they find a bump behind her ear. So now they know trackers are in our ears. And they remember that they always had these bumps, you know, when they were kids, they just had gone away on them because, you know, the surgery site was just. What a perfect analogy to an ear tag. Oh, <laughs> yeah. as, soon as, I saw, as soon as I saw that, I was like, okay, yeah, they are cattle. <laughs> yep. And then we also get a conversation between Mama and, and Sister Crone um, where basically she, she, Mama was like, by the way, some of the kids know the secret. And I'm not reporting it because I got it under control. And that's where, you know, Sister Chrome becomes her own team. Like, I could take her down. I could take her down with this and then I can be the mama. And so she's like, okay, I'm in the game too. Ante up. Um, so, so that happens. They clearly do not like each other. We also get a scene of the demons eating, which I think is the only time this happens. And yeah. they talk about the one. And how the special kids, specifically like Norman and Ray and Emma, are reserved for the one. Mm -hmm. The special kids for the special one. Well, I was thinking, is it similar to uh, Starship Troopers where... Brain bug? They, well, and it, it ingested the brain to fuel itself. Is the one needing more brain meat to make sure it stays intelligent or at least stays on top like does it need that prime this is why i want a season two <laughs> so, so, okay to, to say that at the end of, of our review we are going to have a discussion of whether we want a season two or not we all decide we want to talk about it we've all had different opinions on it this is one of those threads that they leave dangling yeah. out there not resolved yeah because the yeah these demons or aliens or monsters or whatever they are we get very little screen yeah. time which yep. and, again and i think is a great oh, great for this yeah. Very, yeah. very intense world building like oh yeah there's a demon world out there but like they ask how did this happen i don't know well they also tell us that there's humans that live as equals in that society out there right and someone's making the clothes someone's making the food for these children yeah so What's the deal with that? <laughs> what's, <laughs> <the deal> with <laughs> that? <laughs> um, what subjugated society is okay with these farms? As long as it's not me. The kid, <laughs> the kids then to get the other kids ready, knowing that they can't just go and tell them, Hey, by the way, your mom's working for demons and we're all going to die. <laughs> <laughs> Start using the game of tag as a training exercise to get them ready to leave, to get them to think, you know, the way they need to be thinking and really bring them up to the level they need to be at to escape. Athletically, and, too. And, yeah, physically as well. But once they start doing this, Sister Crone decides to play because <laughs> oh. she wants to see how she competes against the top students. Uh -huh. And we get a great scene of her chasing. Um, she comes up on two little kids and Emma grabs the two kids and like dashes off with them and hides in the rocks. And she's out there looking for her. And she mentions by the way, did you learn the secret? <laughs> but she Man. also makes, uh, she calls to Emma. And I think this is one of the first scenes where Emma starts to realize that maybe her plan's not as great as she thinks. Yeah. It is. Because she, Crone points out to her, you've made a terrible mistake taking on these two kids for yourself because you probably could have got away from me. Yeah, yeah, this was foreshadowing. She actually, this is one of those moments where she calls out and says, your weakness is your naivety and your desire to help others, even if it dooms you. Yep. And then she catches her. And she does catch her. <laughs> but she doesn't catch Ray or Norman, and she gets a little frustrated by that, which I think was really great at showing her where she fits in the hierarchy of, of brain battle here. Like, she's under Mama, Norman, Ray, and over Emma. <laughs> yep. And only over Emma if Emma is trying to help someone. Right. If Emma wasn't, she could totally get away. Then a couple of days pass and the kids realize there's probably a spy. One of the other kids is probably informing Mama on us. And then the camera zooms in on poor Gilda. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, they wanted us to believe it was Gilda so bad. Yeah, um, we get another scene with with. Sister Crone talking with Mama, um, where Mama's basically like, 
that tag game you played was a screw up. Don't let that happen again. And really berates her and is like, you know, you just need to behave yourself and things that go well for you. Don't try to whatever it is you're doing. Let that go. <laughs> just do what I tell you and things will be fine. Basically, she knows. Right. Yep. Again, mama's one step ahead of everyone. Yeah. Um, is this also the uh, the episode where uh, Emma discovers there's the house isn't quite built the way it perceives? Um, that is coming up oh, okay. soon. It's actually next episode. Um, okay. so so in this one, because they they decide okay, we got to put the kids into teams if we're gonna get them out of here. And we need more people. So we need to bring in Dawn and Gilda. So I, I want to talk about them. Dawn, one of my favorite characters, because I thought this, because he starts off with like, I'm just under the smart kids. I can't catch, I can't beat Norman and Tag. I I want to, I, I challenge you again. Mm-hmm. And I thought for sure he's going to be an issue. <laughs> That, you know, his own selfish desire and the need to be the best. And they didn't go that way with him. He kind of admits, like, you know, I'm not as good as you guys, but I, I want to. I'm still a part of this family. I'm still useful. I absolutely love that they didn't take the obvious road with him and just let him develop as a good character. Well, yeah. And I mean, they do like they head that direction very soon. They give him a moment to explore that idea. And then come to the realization that it's not a good path. And that was kind of cool, too. Yeah. It was a great growing uh, mechanic for him, even though he's not like a quote unquote main character. He Mm -hmm. he gets his spotlight. He gets his character growth and he feels like a real part of this team and also a necessary part. Mm -hmm. Gilda, a little less so. She's kind of usually the person to point out flaws in plans, which I thought was kind of cool. And she is kind of our patsy for this, this next episode. We're always like, mm, Gilda, I'm on to you. Um, <laughs> but, you know, she was she was a sweet girl, but not as important as the other characters. I'm really glad because usually when you have the big glasses, the mousy character, she's going to be super, super smart. Right. Mm. She, she's going to be the book nerd. Mm-hmm. And she's going to, you know, they're going to find certain insight from her. I'm kind of glad they didn't go that way with her and make her so cliche. Uh but allow her to be important enough to this plan that uh, she's needed, even though she didn't have the spotlight that Dawn did. Yeah. We also meet best character, Phil, the little oh, Phil's <laughs> awesome. four year old who's, who's the next level of prodigy, the next generation of prodigy yep. through this family. Why does uh, I th- mouth? Hmm? Cause he, cause it's adorable. He's mischievous, mischievous, <laughs> mischievous. I thought they were setting him up for something more. But yeah. they did what they did set him up for. They did set him up for well. Like it was like, okay, this one hundred percent makes sense. You totally put in the time to explain this coming up to it. Yeah, the very first uh, characters that I suspected as being the traitor were were Phil, Gilda, and uh, and Dawn. Because I mean, there's even scenes where you have the main characters chatting and talking about their story, and then you have the camera angle almost seems like it's coming from a place that's too short for anybody except Phil (laughs) and Phil is just in all these convenient scenes where you're like, okay, the camera is on you a lot. Why am I supposed to be noticing you this much? Are you the villain? Are you a traitor? Uh, Also with all the other kids, like Phil's the name they keep saying, Oh, Hey, there's Phil walking by everybody (laughs) Phil's walking through the scene. Mm -hmm. That's cool. (laughs) And it Mm -hmm. was total real world sense that a four year old would just tattle, tattle, tattle spout what his day was like today. Yeah. Yep. Anyway, so when they um, they do tell Don and Gilda what's going on, they lie about Connie because Don's first thought is like, well, if this is they say it's human trafficking. Like if it's human trafficking, we got to go get Connie. Just like, a variation uh, yeah, of it. Yeah, <laughs> kind of. This, um, even though it comes to bite them in the butt later, I felt was a, a smart move on the main character's part uh, because it's much easier to grasp Mm -hmm. oh human trafficking from an orphanage like that's that's within the realm of possibility but then to say there's these (laughs) extraterrestrials because that's a little tough to believe especially in these idyllic situation right especially without any evidence um so it's it it, i thought it was a great decision by emma even though yeah the did backfire on him but i think 
it worked in their favor once the truth came out that it wasn't so unbelievable at that point. Right. Yeah, because it was very important that those kids didn't immediately go to mom and be like, you won't believe the story these guys told us. This is stupid and ridiculous. <laughs> right. Yeah. You, you know, my my wife, like I said, sat down and actually watched a couple episodes of this one. She was she was kind of into the story. I kept asking about it. And one thing she asked is like, well, if the, when the camera showed Gilda, she's like, if they know Gilda's the traitor, is that really that suspenseful? I'm like, yeah, because what do you do about it? How do you convince her she's wrong? <laughs> Even if, if Gilda was the traitor, how do you walk up to the traitor and be like, could you not? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> demons and they're gonna eat us i'm gonna tell mom you said that oh crap that plan did not work out <laughs> well even yep. emma told norman because norman asks her like you know if we find out someone's a traitor are you willing to leave them behind and she's like yeah. no yeah right <laughs> speaking of traitors though we do need to mention that norman t- explains to ray i've said i set a trap for don and gilda i'm gonna tell don we have a rope and under my bed i'm gonna tell gilda we hit a rope over here and whatever rope disappears, we'll know if one of them is a traitor. And no, neither rope disappears. We keep our ropes, and we know there's no traitor. As soon as he said that, I was like, "It's, it's Ray." <laughs> there's, there's also a scene where he asks Ray, Norman asks Ray, like, "Why would the traitor do this?" And Ray says, "Well, maybe it would help them survive. They would not get to be turned mm-hmm. into cattle." And I was like, "Ah, that's really insightful." <laughs> yeah, for a traitor. <laughs> It's good that you can think like a traitor. <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, Ray is the traitor. You, you should know that by now. But yeah. what I did really like is that even though Ray is the traitor, it's not just a cut and dry. Yeah, I'm evil. Suck it. <laughs> right. right. I'm not. I'm not in, in league with the bad guys. Right. We do. We do get an intercutting here of scenes where like mom is being passed a note and Gilda's sneaking out at the same time. And then Gilda goes to Sister Crone. So so Gilda kind of was a spy as in that she was approached by Sister Crone to gather information. But at this point rejects Sister Crone, even though Sister Crone's like, oh, by the way, you're freaking food. <laughs> you need that. Why don't you work with me? Um, Sister Crone has no problem of just like laying all her cards out and going all in on the on the poker game. Um but yeah, uh, Gilda's, you know, rejects it. And, and so they know Gilda's not the traitor. And then we get the scene where Norman and Ray check the ropes. The rope under the bed is gone. And he turns to Ray and he's like, by the way, I didn't tell Don this is where the rope is. I only told you that. And he's like, you're the traitor. And then Ray's like, ha, 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 ha. yeah, what are you going to do? Yeah. <laughs> Ray, <laughs> uh, but Ray explains, like, yeah, I'm the traitor. How else was I supposed to get information? I've known this for years. Um, I I gave myself over to the bat enemy team, and I started collecting both supplies and information. And what's really great is when the scene starts, Norman has the, the power, he thinks. He's like, I caught you, and here's my demands. You're going to join our team. You're going to pass fake information. And you're gonna, there was something else. And then when mm-hmm. Ray reveals, like, I've been setting up escape for years right so now here's what you're going to do <laughs> you're going to betray emma and we're going to escape just the three of us and and, and norman's like okay you got me <laughs> yep <laughs> uh so such a good scene and then there's this great scene where norman or yeah ray walks out he's walking down the hall he's got this big smile and and norman's sitting on his bed defeated you know frowning they get to the end of the scene and Ray suddenly realizes he tipped his hand too far and he's, uh, he gets all, you know, he gets this grumpy face and Norman realizes the same thing and he smiles. Uh-huh. <laughs> he said a little too much, which we find out later was he didn't say the three of us are going to escape. He said, I'm going to get you guys out of here. <laughs> yep. Um, I did love the reasoning from Ray is that, I want you guys to survive. And that was yep. really disconcerting to hear for me when he said, I've been doing all this so you guys can live. I was like, you, you don't plan on living. Yep. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, Ray, then <laughs> they have this meeting with Emma and he's like, oh, by the way, I was a traitor. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And Norman's like freaking out. Like, yeah. Whoa, I wasn't going to tell her. Uh, but then Ray points out, by the way, every mistake you guys made, who do you think covered you? You know, who who do you think's been cleaning up? Who rang that dinner bell to get you out of mm-hmm. your little interrogation? 
I've been following behind you and cleaning up your messes. You, yeah. you should be thanking me that I'm the spy. I thought it was interesting that Emma then says, wait a minute. Does that mean that you've just been standing by as every child has been eaten? Not only that, and she mentions like how, you know, how, how you've been testing the trackers and stuff. What have you been doing mm-hmm. to the other kids? And he's just, yep. and she's like, nope, maybe don't tell me because I don't want to hate you. That's right. <laughs> you did what you had to because you know what? None of you would have survived without Ray's foundation. And then, he, then we get the scene where Emma reports that she, she's realized mom has a secret room and, and Ray's like, yeah, that's probably where she radios back to headquarters. And Don and Gilda are like, well, guess where we're going? <laughs> They're like, no, don't do that. And then they go do it. This was that moment where Don gets to show like how he could be a foil. <laughs> mm-hmm. This and was so bad. I was tense the whole time. This was super tense because yeah. like Jason pointed out, because a cute little girl died in the first episode, there's no one safe. Mm-mm. There and and th- honestly, this anime doesn't have a ton of death, but it doesn't matter because there is no plot armor. There is no one who is guaranteed survival at any moment. If Don had died in this very moment, it would not have been a surprise. It would have been like, yeah, that that makes sense in this show. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> that's fantastic. Um, I, I was a hundred percent convinced both of them were going to eat it uh, down in this thing, but I love that Don somehow has the ability for a like sh- like New York City street bump and snatch. Yeah. <laughs> like, where did he learn that? But it's fantastic. Well, uh, I mean you gotta assume these kids are probably more physically gifted than any average kid, right? But yeah. Uh also when they're first breaking into Mama's room, uh, the door starts to open and there's Phil. Yep. <laughs> uh or there's your kid. I think it was a cat freaking uh, out for no reason. So yeah, the when that door opens, there's Phil. Hey Phil, how's it going? <laughs> but they do get the key, they do sneak in, and not only is the radio room in there, but also all the toys of all the kids that have Yeah, come this behind. is this is where I thought that maybe there was some potential for Mama to have some sentimental attachment to the kids as like a regret and a wish that maybe she could help some of them escape. And so she's like, I mean, there's, there's a books that show up later that I have no idea where they came from or what they're supposed to do or who wrote them or how they're, how they're supposed to help. I thought maybe mama penned them and obviously not, but yeah, seeing her, her little basement and what she had kept as mementos of all of these didn't strike me as a serial killer as much as a sentimental mother. But but it freaks out Dawn that yeah uh, little bunny is down there because yeah. he's like wait why is it here I thought they said yep. they gave it to Connie <laughs> the so yeah he realizes he's been lied to him and Gilda but at the same time we're getting to keep the tension high they're flashing back to the over to these scenes of the other the three main characters in the library looking at the very books that Jeremy just mentioned the books with the owl stamp and they have Morse code encircled around these owl stamps and they're trying to figure out what this this coded message is it's from an author named minerva but we don't ever this is another one of those loose threads that they just kind of leave out in the wind Mm -hmm. and it almost has no effect on the story to be honest like they don't learn anything from it well they get a little encouragement they They learn that somebody outside wrote it but that's right but that somebody outside knows about their plight so either it's somebody either this is public knowledge and it's a Mm. problem or it's a secret facility and someone from inside escaped and is writing secret messages, basically saying, hey, keep up the survival. You, you can't escape like I, I did. See, I thought that that <clears throat> wouldn't be very different from figuring that the clothes were made by humans outside who would be aware of their plight. Right. So, but yeah, when they as- if if it is a society that's like, oh, we need to capture these kids and return them this means that there's some sort of resistance out there to help them. That's true. Mm-hmm. The, the, the question I still have is what is the circle without the Morse code? Uh, the, mm-hmm. the message seemed to be trying to like mention the promise. Never let I, I believe these books is where the title is kind of coming from. Right. Um, because one of them is promise promise. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and it's mentioning stuff about it, escape and things like that and, and prison and, and 
food. <laughs> but there's this one book with just a plain circle. I was I kept waiting for that to be the final answer that they needed mm -hmm. to get out, and and it's not. There, there's no. Um, they even revisit it. No, and especially Ray spends like the last two episodes piled in books, and I thought for sure he was figuring it out, and nope. Mm -hmm. So, um, Ray keeps reporting to mom, even though now he's feeding her false information. And he tells her Norman is going to try to kill you with poison, and she tells him, "Hey, just so you know, you're shipping out on your birthday." <laughs> <laughs> Love you too, son. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Then Sister Crone finds the others practicing, and she basically comes up, up to them and is like, hey, it's time to team up. It's time to form an alliance. <laughs> Again, this is a character who, whose strategy is to go all in. Like, there, there is no holding any cards back for her. So she, she's basically like, yeah, I'm part of the killing you guys, but I want to help you. I, you guys escape. I become mama. Everyone's happy. Everyone wins. Um, and she's like, I will, she, this is where they find out, you know, the moms used to be kids. They have the tattoos too. And she, and, and that she's got a device in her chest. Yeah. yeah. They, right. When you become, when you become part of the organization, they put something in your chest. That's right. It will basically stop your heart if you go outside the walls. Mm -hmm. And then she offers them more information if they come to her room. Um, then we get a scene where Emma asks so that all the kids are talking about this. And then before they go off to talk to her and, and the scene ends with Emma going up to Don and Gilda and be like, I need a favor. And I completely forgot about that scene until I was reading through my notes. And I was like, Oh my God, I know what that favor is now. <laughs> so that's, that's really cool. Uh, again, layers and layers, but they go to her room and they, they try to get information out of her about the tracking devices. And they're like, yeah, we totally don't know how to get rid of them. And she's like, well, you could always cut off your ear. That would you know, be effective. And I can get you all the supplies you want. And then they get a little more information about the outside world. And they go to leave. And she starts laughing. And she's like, you totally know how to break the tracking devices. I can't believe you fell for that. <laughs> when I when I told you they were in your ear, none of you tried to touch your ear. You you were trying to hide it. It's very clear. You guys are horrible at lying. You're never going to survive. <laughs> but feel free to come back whenever you want. Um, and then she promises to tell them about him next time. Mm -hmm. And that never comes to fruition either. Yep. Which it, it's interesting because I think that this is another one of those. I know that you know that I know that you know that <laughs> we know how to do the trackers. Like I have a feeling both Emma and Norman knew this is how she would react because this this was a this wasn't about pulling information from her. It's about something else that will. Yeah, we don't even we'll, find out we'll for see later. Yeah, there is, there is some information they pull out of her because they they got to see the tracker and how detailed it is and like how right. So they do get some information out of her. I don't think they wanted to tip off the information that they knew how to release the tracker. However, they do, and they run to Ray and tell him, and then Ray comes up with a great plan, which is when she goes to look for it, she's like, oh, "I gotta find that that tracker breaker." She finds a little slip of paper instead with some information about Mama. And <laughs> she runs back to her room and she's so excited. And then there's this great ending scene to this episode where Mama comes to her door and she's holding a knife. And there's that gasp of air. And then yeah, Mama hands her an She flinches. <laughs> she does. She looks at the knife and flinches. It's just a letter opener. But oh, man. But I was like, okay. She got stabbed and she's dead. <laughs> but no, she got a letter and she's being recalled back to headquarters because she is getting promoted to mother of plant four. It's weird. They call them plants instead. Of, you know, I always think ranch or farm, but they call them the plants. Um, yeah. I mean, these are free range kids. So <laughs> what's, what's amazing about this is that this is, this was her goal, right? To become a mom. And she realizes that this is her defeat. Mm -hmm. And it's fantastic. But she has her note and she leaves something for the kids. She leaves a note and a package behind for them. And she goes out to the gate and grandma is there. And grandma's basically, look at their other moms. <laughs> Sorry about what that. What was that? Wow. My headset came down and I thought it was a bee. Oh, <laughs> fair enough. 
It's wasp season. That's great. <laughs> I hate wasps. <laughs> anyway, she goes to the gate. Grandma's there. She's who's basically the leader of the moms. We never actually get to see Grandma's face. She's just the evil lady in charge. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you find, and she realizes, oh my god, Grandma's been in, in on this the whole time. Because she's like, hey, the kids are escaping. And Grandma's like, meh. <laughs> I, I have a feeling from the way this scene was played out, it could have gone one of two ways. Either uh, Crone comes to the gate, thanks mom, and mom takes her to plant for. Mm-hmm. Or what happens, happens. I don't think it was set in stone until she started blabbing about, we need to investigate Isabella, we need to, you know, she's, she's got uncontrollable kids. Like, if, because it, my, uh, grandma says something very specific, she's like, you're not going to fit into my plans. And I have a feeling mom doesn't really give a rip whether the kids know or not. She just wants to make sure that there's control. Mm-hmm. Right. Yep. Yep. Um, and I, so a demon comes basically and kills Cronin. We get to see her flashbacks, her life of, of being selected to become a mom and all the, the, I love that there's physical combat training to become a mom, which we, comes into play in the story. So you, can, you can't even say that's worthless. Um, but that her final like thought as she's dying is like, I hope those kids freaking win. <laughs> you, guys, <laughs> you guys better win and get the hell out of there. I, I love that she's not on these monsters or, or mom's team really that that there is a honest part of her that hopes these kids win now that her ambitions have been defeated yeah in a way that she's still struggling against it more than isabella did yes mm-hmm. uh, yeah because she because she left that package even though she was going to bust them when she got to the gate yep. she left something for them so they could win too uh that's really cool uh, again or this terrifying character who then suddenly becomes sympathetic just through great storytelling right before she dies, right before she dies. <laughs> but it's interesting because again, we see somebody in an innocent situation, well, not a really bad situation that's innocent. And you can kind of see yourself or literally anybody in that situation doing exactly what she did. And it's, and, and watching that person break mentally like that's that's a real possibility the futility of it Mm -hmm. yeah so this leads now to a new series of events because basically it's like the day before escape and and norman and emma are going to climb the wall and make sure that this is doable all this and and, and so ray is is going to help mom find the poison chemicals and which will keep her distracted and while they're going up to do this she tells him by the way, Sister Crone has been eliminated, which ties back into an earlier conversation they had where he's like, why did you bring another helper? You didn't need to do that. And she's like, I have you to control the kids. I have her to control you. And so as soon as she tells him Sister Crone is dead, I no longer need to control you. <laughs> uh-huh. And she even tells him our deal's done. Yeah, I, I, I know you're <laughs> I know you've been lying to me. I know you're no longer playing you know, on my team, I've still been using you. It's completely fine, <laughs> but I'm going to lock you in this room. Ha- have a good time until your birthday. <laughs> when you get shipped out, I'm going to go stop this stuff. Um, Don tries to get, he actually does get Ray out and they, they try to run to the force, but mom gets there first. This is a fantastic scene where Norman and Emma hear her coming. They throw the rope off into the bushes and she comes up and she's like, I'm so glad I get to meet you guys as myself. Uh-huh. And, and we're no longer having to pretend who we are. Guys, I know you want to get out of here, but isn't it better that you, you're going to die anyway? Nothing out there but misery. You can live a great, happy life until your purpose is served here. What could be better than that? <laughs> like someone mentioned that she's in doctrine. And, and here we finally get to hear that spout out that she has convinced herself that what she's doing is not evil. And this is her point of view. Um, there's something I want to say, but I'm actually going to save it because this is the scene we're saving for Baka Breakdown. So I'm going to, I'm going to bite my tongue for now. For Jason's Baka Breakdown, this will be the scene. And I'll have something to say there. We all come Perfect. back now, you hear. But Jeremy, you, you can say whatever you want. You know, you, you can rip this up. Well, 
I just was shocked that she actually broke her leg. That was amazing when that happened. It came out of left field for me, and it just kind of really demonstrated that all she's really worried about is delivering a good product. Even though she may say all these things about love and about trying to take care of them. And, and I mean, as long as they're willing to be a good product in the end, she will do those things. She really does mean that. But if you step out of line, you know, she she's going to. Yeah, that was it was really good. Yeah, because she she's convinced herself that they're going to die anyways. Why not make their time here the best possible it can be? Yeah. Like and and I think that's kind of where her uh, dementia comes from. I guess that's the best word I can come from. Come up with. Uh, because, yeah, she she wants to see them happy. Uh, up and because they even point out, you know, w- w- what about Connie? You know, she's, you know, her, her, she's not so happy anymore, is she? And she's, and she actually counters with, she was really, really happy until the moment she was eaten. <laughs> and that was okay for, that was the solace mama needed. And yeah, so, the- but, but I mean, like, it makes perfect sense if she's genuinely believing that it was futile. If she genuinely 100% believes you cannot escape, yes, then and that's established. What thing could you do? Yeah, right. right. Also, I got to call out that when it, it's off screen that it happens, that snap of, of the leg when she oh, breaks no. her leg, the lack of plot armor is so real. I was 100% sure it was her neck. Yeah, I oh. heard the snap and I was like, oh my God, they just killed Emma. And I knew they killed Emma. And I was like, oh, I guess this anime is going to be about Ray and Norman like picking up her her ideals and trying to make them complete. And then it shows her leg and I'm like, Oh my God, I can't believe that she died because there's nobody safe. Yeah. Um, I think one of the really scary parts about this though, is that immediately after busting her leg, she starts treating her as if it was an accident and she yep. fell down and hurt herself. Mm-hmm. Oh, poor baby. Don't cry. It doesn't hurt in her eyes. Emma broke her leg. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah. She's like, I had to do that. As in like, that was the absolute natural thing that would happen based on your actions. It, it wasn't me that caused that. It was your actions that led to this leg being broken. Yeah. That's like teacher asks kid, Hey, where'd you get the bruises? And then the parent goes, he fell down the stairs. <laughs> well, and I mean, and in this circumstance, it, it made perfect sense from the mind of futility again, that Emma's strength is her athletic athletics ability. And as if you can take that away from her, you can break her. And it, that's what she's after is breaking her. And and I love all the dialogue here about like, guys, no, I, I, I control you. There's never been a point in this whole basically anime where I, I haven't been in control of you. <laughs> and Norman realizes this and the way his face is drawn yep. is amazing in the scene as you can see him break it all down in his mind of like this, 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 she knew this, 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 she knew this, 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 she countered like she's been on top of us this entire time. Mm-hmm. Oh, and then and then she informs him. Oh, by the way, it's not Ray going out. <laughs> Norman. Well, no, because Ray's date is set, and they, they stick to that. But she then tells, like, yeah, and no, by the way, Norman, special thing was done, so you're shipping out tomorrow. <laughs> yep. Congratulations, she says. Yeah. Um. So so in our next episode, Emma's laid up with a broken leg. Norman is leaving the next day and basically Ray and Emma are like, look, break your tracker, go hide in two months. When my leg is healed, we will come get you and we will all leave together. And he's like, that's insane. That'll ruin everything. And he goes, what about Ray? Oh, Ray can just break his arm. (laughs) Yeah. I thought he was going to do it just right there. And then, yeah, because, because Norman says, if I'm, if I'm not available, they, they still are going to need to send somebody. They can't, you know, they're going to send one of you. And Emma counters with, well, not if we're both broken. How did you guys feel about, and it was, I really noticed it here, and this is not the first time they did it, where the hallway is CGI and the character is drawn and walking through the hallway. And so the, like, we get to follow him as he goes down the hallway of the house. It's when he goes to get the drink of water. There's this long him walking through the house and, and we get to go with him because they were at CGI for the hallway. Good, bad. 
It didn't feel wonky at all. The only part that felt wonky was the first person um, scene. Going through the halls. Yeah, there there was like going up the stairs and opening the door. And it was meant to show from a first person point of view, like how short the person was to give you an idea that it was someone mm-hmm. younger. Um, that was really the only wonky one that felt a little weird. But walking him, watching him walk down the hallway back and forth, uh, didn't, uh, I didn't miss a beat. I didn't even notice a change in anything for any of it. Okay. Yeah. Well done. Uh- in this same scene, so Norman eventually does agree, like, okay, I'll go along with your guys' plan. Uh, and this is where they, they ask Ray, like, by the way, how did you learn about the demons? He's like, I have had memories since I was a fetus. I didn't get that infant amnesia that everybody else gets. And I remember, you know, tubes and demons and being shipped and all that stuff, which turns out to be a great setup for a great oh, reveal. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. yeah. Favorite part, oh man! But uh, but we re- but we do come to the realization that he he was born in this like mega plant and then right. shipped to this particular plant. Like he he was not born off site. Like this has been his existence. There there aren't parents out there who love him and he was taken away from and and he can get back to. It's like you were made in this world to be eaten. Mm-hmm. This truly is a farm. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so Gilda starts making new rope for Norman to use. Um, Norman finds Crone's package, which will be important later. He then goes to the wall on, on the day uh, he's supposed to ship out. Um, uh, he climbs up to the top and he sees this endless forest. And at the end of the day, mom goes to check her, her tracker device. She's like, where's Norman? Oh, there he is. And he's come walking back up and, and, and Ray is just like losing his mind. Like, are you kidding me? Yep. Yeah. Devastated. And, and Norman's like, that's a cliff. There's nothing past the wall, but a cliff and you, and a huge ch- ch- chasm, chasm, yeah. chasm, chasm to the other side. I know English. <laughs> yeah. It's not something you can just jump across. But no. it's again, the despair on his face, the anguish, the weariness, so well drawn. <laughs> but yeah, this calls back to that tiny fence that they right. first come across. It's like, what's beyond the tiny fence? Oh, really big wall. Oh, what's beyond the wall? Oh, not just an endless forest, but a chasm. A chasm. Yep. Circles and levels of control endlessly. Um. Mm-hmm. So he tells him everything he saw, and he explains how... We're basically like in a triangle of this giant hexagon. hexagon yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and that the only way out is at the HQ. There is a bridge. Um, that you could, so you could go around the wall to the HQ where all the demons are and there's a bridge there. And that'd be the only mm-hmm. way out. Um, and then he tells them though that when I told you I'd survive, I was lying. I, I never intended to escape. Um, so he says his goodbyes and we get this really cool flashback of when he was sick and Emma kept coming in to visit him, which both shows why he loves her, but also that Emma never quits at anything, no matter how stupid yep. it is. <laughs> this God, this flashback felt so out of place at this point in the anime because of how happy go lucky everyone was like, she sneaks in. Mama tells her to leave. She leaves. Mama tapes the door with like caution tape. And then she breaks in again. And here's Mama like holding her upside down, like taking her out. She's kicking her legs and everything's just so like, you know, normal, happy. And it's like, this is really disconcerting. <laughs> I just, love it. It was yeah. the layers of complexity because like you say, we knew what was really going on and what, what mama must really be thinking about. Absolutely. Right. Love that. Yeah. It's a good contrast. You know, knowing what we know about the ending of this, uh, anime, this scene has completely new context where he goes and says goodbye to all the children and they're all like, oh, bye, Norman. Have a good time. Yeah. Cause he's yeah. coming too. Yep. Um, Emma tries one more time. She tries to tackle him and like literally just because it's the the tracker breaker is basically a little taser that will EMP shock the device, right? Mm-hmm. That he's been building from spare parts he's been collecting over his whole life. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And she, Emma tries to tackle him and zap him with it. And he manages to stop her and hide it. And Mama picks up Emma. Is like, poor, poor Emma. I'll kill you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah. No, literally, I'll kill you if you yeah. do something like that again. Yeah. When they go out, Norman asks Mama if she's happy. And it stuns her for a second before she finally says, yes, because I got to be with all you children. Um, but God, that, I, lo- I love that reaction. It's like a break in the cognitive dissonance for just a, uh, just a moment. Like, do you really believe this happiness drivel you're speaking about? Because it's <laughs> not true. And, and then, then he kicks back in. And then we go to the gatehouse and she takes him into the side room and the day is over. Now, so this is weird. Yes. This was weird because he goes to the truck because that's where they found Connie and he figures, oh, I'm going to get in the truck. Something's going to kill me and that's going to be that. When she takes him off to the side room, does that mean that there is a special place for, you know, boys that make it past 12? Is, is, is there up to 12? Is he really dead? So there's something interesting that I was thinking about. I was like, okay, we didn't actually see him die. Mm-hmm. And in Isabella's flashback that we'll get to later, there's uh, male doctors mm-hmm. or scientists milling around. Like and, with Crone Psalm too. Yeah. Right. Her so class. I'm wondering, do they also pick other staff from the kids to train them up inside this facility? Exactly. And, and is he going to be indoctrinated into this system as well? I, I'm Yeah, I'm really curious. Yep. Yep. So then Ray and Emma get really depressed as, as you assume as their best friend has died. Um, Ray declares to everyone, I give up. I'm just, I'm not doing this anymore. Now, this was awesome because in the, the early part, when they were talking about the weaknesses each of the kild- children have, Ray's weakness was he gives up too easily because as a realist, when you confront something that you cannot see a solution, sometimes you just imagine there isn't one and you stop trying. And it was brilliant to see that happen to Ray. Absolutely loved that they did that. That is good. Yeah, good and Emma seemed to be doing the same because there was like all these different shots from Mama's point of view of her just being sad, depressed, mm-hmm. like head down, not, never not, laughing or having well, joy. You skipped over a little bit something that I have oh, to touch on. Okay. Mama comes to her and basically is like, you need to give up. And she's like, look, I'm going to recommend you for the mama program. You'll do great. Yeah. You'll have a baby. You'll give it up. <laughs> yes. You'll become a- When she dropped that line that you'll have a kid, I was like, holy crap, they go out and produce the children that they're yep. raising for feeding. <laughs> and if you, and the, since there's only a limited amount of mama roles, if you don't become a mama, are you just a baby factory? I think so. Yes. Holy moly. Yeah, that is smart, smart. That's why I was asking about like the number of the factory. And I think it also may factor into the number of the mother. Um, could have something to do with the number on the neck. Number of mother, number of children the woman has given birth to, and the number of the factory they come from, something like that. Um, but the, Emma does refuse her. But yes, then you get the scene like Emma's just sitting around. She's giving up. People keep coming and talking to her and trying to get her to, to play. And she just does not do anything. Don and Gilda trying to keep the kids happy, doing their stuff. Um. And then finally, the night before Ray's birthday, his sh- the night before his shipping out night, she walks up to him in the middle of the night in the kitchen or in the dining room. The dining yeah. room, yeah. And he says, "Have you actually given up, guys? This might be one of my favorite <laughs> photographs ever." Her face. There's so many. She's so exhausted. The lines are everywhere. She's clearly been beaten down and stuff. But that smile, <laughs> the oh, smile yeah. shines through like, hell no. <laughs> I was yeah. like, yeah, I knew this was coming, but that is still a great way to present this. I was I was confused when I saw her I face. Too. I was yeah. like, has she turned? <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering if mama had turned her. 
I genuinely thought that might be the end point for Emma was that she would become a mom and this would be a tragic anime. I, 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 I was worried about that, that was, yeah. but I didn't think it was at this moment. I, it actually was the, the ending of the, the next episode, the last episode. Oh. I thought that there might be a tragic ending, but so our well, second to last episode, we do have two more. Um, so Emma basically is like, yeah, literally I've been maintaining the plan this whole time. I've been tending to be <laughs> depressed and feeding information. Don and Gilda have done all the work while I, cause, cause both Ray and Emma came up with the same idea separately. As long as we keep mama looking at us, she's not going to be paying attention to the other kids. And Emma convinced Norman to tell everybody <laughs> and we find out it's not literally everybody but almost everybody they told about the thing slowly at the time that that conversation with sister crone they had kids outside that was the favor that she asked for from donna gilda to bring kids to the door they've been getting recruiting this entire time and no, despite how dangerous it is again something Ma- mama couldn't fathom and Norman and Ray wouldn't consider because it's so stupid. It's so idealistic <laughs> that nobody would turn and nobody would blabber and ruin it, believing in everybody. And it, it's the only thing that worked. I, I think that's really cool. <laughs> and they, cool. Yeah. And they, they finally decided, should we tell the four and under? Because Emma comes to the realization that we just cannot bring the babies. I, I think Gilda convinces her of this. Yeah. <laughs> well, so she- she grabs Phil and tells Phil. Right. And like, and, this is a brilliant scene. And she asked Phil, like, Phil, what should we do? And Phil's like, you got to leave us. We're, we're just not ready. Well, and we have two years before they're willing to sacrifice any of us because they don't do it till we're six. Right. And I thought this was great because it showed compromise. Like her idealism. Yes, it was possible, but not completely. Only mm-hmm. to an extent. Like she couldn't achieve everything that she wanted to achieve and she had to eventually realize that there was a point where she had to draw the line and i respected that decision in the anime so much very very good um but ray has his own plans like we have to do this tonight i have been collecting oil and molotov cocktails that are hidden in the forest <laughs> will set a fire they won't be able to figure it out they haven't listened to the op <laughs> we'll set the building on fire and while they're dealing with that fire. the kids will escape and he's like but we need to keep mama distracted so we can get the babies out of her room and there's one thing she wants and he starts pouring oil on himself he's like I've been doing for this day my whole life I'm gonna ruin their freaking meal and <laughs> and he has had suicide plans from the start Mm-hmm. so then he lights his match and then we jump over to mama who then hears the screaming from emma about ray she runs in realizes her prize food is is burning alive and starts trying to save him when she turns around one second she, what she says is if i can at least save his brain and I when save she his said brain. that i realized yeah the product trumps anything about how she cares about them there yes. is she would never help them but i yeah. also think this was survival kicking in for her yeah because she realized yeah. that if she loses yep. this product it could mean her life mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and she does mention like what's that smell so so there's there's human burning here she turns around to emma and emma's gone and she starts walking down the hallway and she reaches the like the showers using the tracker and there's emma's ear on the ground well so we missed one part like when when her and ray are talking about escaping ray's like well what about your leg because she's been in crutches this entire time oh yeah she well, stomps the ground like yeah because she's been faking <laughs> yeah uh yeah so so emma and the kids are running they go in the forest and then in the forest is ray also with his ear missing and they show that again she had everyone in on the plan they and Norman knew Ray was going to do this and had told Emma, like, you have to stop him. This He's going to do it this night. He's going to do it. You know, this is his plan. So she did stop him. She caught the match before it hit it. They made up like a fake body full of meat and hair that they cut off of the, the girls. Is, well, um, and like she had the other kids that she had told, they brought in all that stuff. So like, yeah, yeah this was so well thought out. Yeah. And, and then set the fire. And so yeah, Ray's with them. They go to the wall. <clears throat> and the, and um they they jammed 
the radio room using the key mold that Crone had left him. That's what she left him in the box was ability to make a a fake key. And they basically stuck the key in there and broke it. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, so they get on the wall. Mama rushes out and fills there. And, and then again, this is where it's revealed. Like, yeah, we decided we couldn't take anybody for and under. Yeah, I freaked out here because I was like, they left Phil behind. Oh, no. And I know that's exactly what they wanted you to do. Yes. Like, oh, <laughs> they forgot one because I think it ends with Ray going, is everybody here? And then Phil walks up to mom and you're like, crap. Yeah, that's yeah, what I thought too. And, and I, I thought for sure, like, okay, then that, that's where the tragedy is going to come in. They're gonna, someone's going to have to go back for Phil and they're going to get stuck and they're going to get stuck in this world while everyone else gets to escape. But no, because again, we find out this was this was chosen. Yeah, she does. Mama does have a portable radio, so she does flag the demon security. They go into <laughs> high alert. They're like, literally, just kill all the kids, save the smart ones. Yeah, you know, we we just need the brains of the super smart ones. Which makes me wonder, what like is this needed for the one, right? Yeah, how, like is it how it? how vital? Yeah, they don't go to the bridge like they're supposed to. Norman found a different spot where the 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 cliff isn't as far apart. And they've been practicing. Now, this is a little bit of a not set up well, because they're like, oh, yeah, we were training on how to throw ropes across chasms and stuff this yeah. whole time. Um, but so, I like I like that Don was the guy who yeah. had to come. He's through. the biggest. Yeah, he finally got his moment to shine. Yeah. Um, there was, I, I think there was one scene that I remembered where the kids were playing with their with their water bottles that they they filled and like carbonated or something and then shot out. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, there was. But I didn't, I don't remember anything about Dawn practicing previously to the flashbacks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I, I think that, that was the first time. But it, like I said, it, it was cool for Dawn to get his moment. He, um, they basically start zip lining across these ropes that they shoot across and tie to the other side. Um, Mama's like, wait, why are we not catching them? How are they getting past the, they're not at the bridge. And I love that she has this move to get up on the wall that she practiced as a kid for her own escape. So she's able to just like flip and swing onto the wall through this classic move she had practiced um, and starts just running down the wall. And in the last couple kids get scared of, of the zip line and Ray takes the little girl, which I loved because Ray, the realist who didn't want to save anybody. And he has this big conversation with the ghost of Norman about how, you know, you, sh- you should have believed you should. <laughs> Emma was always the one who was going to get us out of here, stuff like that. But he then makes the character choice to help someone else across through the escape, which was, I thought was a cool jerk in the heartstrings for both Emma and right. They, they got to like, imagine that norman was standing next to them and i'm like i don't know if he's dead i want to think he's not dead but that could just be hopeful on my part like oh, so well done so my wife made the point that, that you've made after i watched it so i watched this all assuming norman was dead it, it didn't even occur to me then my wife like troy if you don't see someone die on screen why would you assume they're dead i'm like oh that's really that's that's true i never do that why would i do that yet <laughs> haven't you seen game of thrones yeah I've, <laughs> I've, I've watched any television show before but i guess i i got because i thought there would be more deaths in this because there was such a weight of it i thought for sure it had to be real dead. Anyway, my bad but <laughs> so at the time of watching this i thought norman was 100 percent dead he, he could still be that i don't know but Man, it adds gravity to this scene. Yes. Um, so, yeah. So, and then the last person across Emma's there and mom catches up to her. And I was like, oh, God, no. <laughs> Please don't do this. <laughs> no. And Emma looks back at the burning house. She looks at mother and she says goodbye to both of them. And she goes across, they cut the ropes, and they're gone. And And mom grabs the ropes, lets her hair down and says, be safe. Mm-hmm. I, I was a hundred percent sure. As soon as Emma let go of the, like with one hand to look back at the burning house, that mom was going to dive her. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. At, but I think at this point, once she saw everyone across, something changed in mama. Mm-hmm. Cause she, she's like, everything about my worldview has just been broken apart. Yes. 
so this is where I think the theme of the anime really comes rushing in because because I've been talking about how there's there's all these levels of controls and levels of control, and I think this is saying that if you subject yourself, let yourself turn over to the control, then you become a part of the control. And with mom, that is literal. Like she literally was keeping them there. But even just saying like, if you allow evil to go on, you are now part of that um, and, and stuff like that. And I, I don't mean that with any ideology behind it at all, but I just think that's the general theme of this. And with these kids escape with that hair coming down, I think a part of Isabella is now free as well. I don't think she's now the team player she was. It reminds me of the bad guy at the end of Serenity. If anyone remembers that movie, it's one of my favorites. When the when the bad guy survives and he's like, "Isn't the government going to come after you?" He's like, "No, but I think they know they know I'm not their guy anymore." Um, and he just kind of fades away into whatever life he has left. That reminded me a lot of this. Mm. Um, I think that this whole scene got a huge amount of gravity because we got a lot of Isabel's flashbacks too. Yes. And about the story, because in the first episode, when she's walking Connie to the, uh, to the gate, she's humming a song and Connie says, you know what, what's that song? That's a pretty song. And she just kind of grins and doesn't say anything. <laughs> right. And, um, a little bit of derangement there. And, um, <laughs> but there's another scene where I heard, and I think it was, I think it was when Ray was standing in there about to burn himself, he was humming the song. And I wondered why Ray would hum that song. It seemed um, strange to me. I don't remember Ray humming. I know mom hummed it a couple times throughout the anime. It was, it was, yeah. it was her big song. I'm pretty yeah. sure he hummed it when he was about to burn himself. Cause I remember noting that there was some point where Ray was humming it. And I was like, this is really weird. And then in the flashback, it shows that she was interested in, this fellow boy that was at the orphanage she was growing up in. And that's his song that he made. And then it shows her entire process she goes through and it shows her getting pregnant and it shows her becoming a mom, being assigned over here, not being pregnant anymore. And, and then it shows Ray sitting. Um, she, yeah, it shows a her really young tracker, one, a really young Ray. And it shows yeah. her looking at her tracker that somebody is near the wall. And so she runs over to the wall, like what's going on? And she's also, or maybe that's not what it was. I remember her humming the song. No, she wasn't humming. He was humming. That's what yeah, it was. She yeah. hears the song. Oh, is like, oh my God, who's humming my yeah. song that only I know. Exactly. That's what it was. And, and I know that wasn't the time I'm thinking of because he was an adult when he was humming it, what I remember. But you realize at that point, oh crap, Ray's her biological, her, her biological, biological son. And he, and he turns and he says, mom, why did you give birth to me? And she just freaks for a moment. And then she stops, regains her indoctrination and says it was for survival. And this, this whole time, like I'd been wondering, you know, this silly infantile amnesia thing is just kind of stupid. I really hated it at first, it, but this scene sold it for me. And I was like, yeah. okay, okay. You just, you just made something really beautiful here. Uh, so yeah, this, that was great. So, so good. Um, then, then mama comes back to the other little kids, helps them get into their blankets. They lay down in the field, you know, waiting for whatever's next. And she looks at Phil and says, don't worry. They got out. Okay. Which sounds like it could be referencing getting away from the fire, but she <laughs> clearly is telling Ray they're okay. And, oh, by the way, I totally know, you know, <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, and the older kids run out into the woods, uh, free and morning breaks. Mm -hmm. And that's the end of this anime. Before we go to final reviews though, we have a, that topic guys, season two, yes or no. Do we want it? Do uh, we not? Who wants yeah. to go first? Yes. Yes. I want it. I want it really bad. Okay. Why? Yeah. Okay. I think the reason why is because, like you said, there are so many strings that they that they touched on. And granted, I can see the the power of this enigma to build this world where you don't have to expound on it. You can leave it there. And, it, it, you know, in our imaginations, we're going to build something probably better than even just the vagueness of it can be more satisfying than having a concrete answer to some of these questions. But at the same time, 
this anime and the writer has shown writer writers. I don't know. I should know, but I don't um, has shown the capability to present really great scenarios and situations with these characters. And I would like to see what happened to Norman. Is he truly dead? Who wrote this book? Where did it come from? What's the society outside of this really like? Is there a, a parallel societies of humans and demons and some kind of resistance? Um, how do these kids try to climatize? How do they come back and rescue these, you know, fulfill their promise? How did this change mom? What's grandma's plan? Like there's so many different factors here that I genuinely want to see. I think it would be a completely different theme, different flavor, different genre perhaps of, of anime for that season. But, uh, yeah, I definitely want more. I do. But I'm I'm hesitant because this anime would be really easy to ruin with a second season. Like really, really easy. There's some really big missteps that would be really easy to take uh, that could ruin what's been told here. And it, it almost feels like this particular season could be left alone. Like if nothing else was ever made about it, yeah, there, I would love to see more. But I would be satisfied with what we have. I think what would probably be best is I, I think it would be a mistake to create a s second season like that started off with them in the like in the woods, like from 12 to 13, like not skipping a beat. I think that would be a mistake to tell that story of them like going through the woods and discovering something. I think it would be much more interesting. If it was like seven years later and they're in a resistance group and because that would put Emma somewhere around 19, 20, 21, but that would also put Phil at 11. Mm. And the complexity because some of those kids would have been sacrificed. Right. But there's still a bunch that, you know, could could be saved. And this is their attempt to like resistance because it almost feels like this world similar to XCOM 2 where the aliens have like subjugated the earth but people still live semi-normal lives in some areas uh, -huh. uh and there's a resistance I I kind of it would be neat to see it from the resistance side I guess I never um, imagined that but now you got me thinking it is XCOM 2 <laughs> 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 um I, I think you could make a season two work where it's just the kids like in the woods. Uh, but I could see a, see it being, uh, like I said, some missteps along the way that could, uh, kind of taint the story for me. So my answer is I didn't, <laughs> I didn't, I d didn't want another season. And for mostly the reason of attack on Titan. Like, look what, and I know you guys don't actually probably know what happened on Attack of Titan, but the answer of Attack on Titan got explained, and it's super disappointing. Mm. It, it is nowhere near as satisfying as it could be. I don't want to know where One Punch Man's power comes from. I don't want to know that the Force comes from midichlorians. <laughs> sometimes the explanation ruins the thing, and there are a ton of storylines, but I'm okay with just being like, there's this really cool world out here, but that wasn't what was important. What was important was these kids experiencing this experience. And I can just let my imagination create the rest. There has been a change though. And that is when my wife yelled at me and said, why would you believe a character died that you didn't see die on screen? <laughs> oh my God. If Norman's alive, I need to know what happened. What, what, what did he see in that room that made his eyes go so wide? Cause he didn't just walk in and see another one of the demons. He was stunned. When he walks into that side room, what did that mean? What could it mean? I'd be in for a season two just for that reason, but I would be completely okay if season two didn't answer 90% of the questions this anime set up. That's why I'm saying if it's like six or seven years later, <laughs> they come back, they actually breach, like they're able to sneak in, right? And they come across Norman and like there's this loving embrace like you know reunion and then all of a sudden a bunch of troops come in and like capture him and they realize norman's now like the bad guy <laughs> so 
what I would be interested in is both to see, yeah, Nor- what happens to Norman? What does it become good? Does it become evil? What is it like when he's out in that world? And then also come back to Mama now that, you know, is she still on that demon side? Maybe the reason none of the kids have been sacrificed because they're all getting such amazing test scores. Everyone's like, this is the best crop we've ever had because mm-hmm. Mama and Phil are like, grooming Grooming. yeah grooming them to survive and she's not she's still pretending to be on the team or maybe even into the gray character there's a lot of potential there with Mm. i think with with mama to make her this maybe a redemption arc it might be way way too late for a redemption arc but something a more gray shade where she's not just the villain of the series and and pitting her against grandma with emma and norman factory actually like those that that battle of wits would be super cool to see actually right. mm-hmm. so so there's a lot of potential but i would be worried like oh just so you know this is all happened because the gates of hell came open and and san francisco fused with hell and <laughs> <laughs> been there <laughs> that that wouldn't be as satisfying in this story is what i'm saying okay let's go to our final reviews jason you picked it you give it the first rating five stars or five bucks uh Nice and quick. <laughs> yeah, uh, I I have very very little criticism uh, for this anime. The show not tell was done brilliantly. Um, the cat and mouse game was fantastically not only animated but told. Um, and this ending was more satisfying than I was anticipating because I was like ready to see. Uh, demon human society. Like I was ready to see, like I was thinking they were like, like going to crash through a tree line. All of a sudden, all of a sudden they're like in a demon human society. And like, people are looking at them weird. Like, wait, where, how'd you guys get out? Like, I thought that was, <laughs> I totally thought that was going to happen. So like, I'm, I'm really happy with the ending. So anyways, I could go on for hours, but praise about this anime, but yeah, five bucks for me. Absolutely. Five bucks. Yep excellent anime there were so many times where the characters would make a move and it was just the perfect visualization of check check right (laughs) you know and you're wondering is this checkmate no 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 we can get out of this we can get out of this you know are you performing some kind of complex move that requires three or five turns to go where you've predicted your opponent doing this thing and then you know just Every time I was actually visualizing, oh, man, okay, so they just moved their castle out of the way of the bishop or some other thing, right? Oh, oh we hopped his, his horsemen over there. It just it perfectly mapped onto the way these characters behave. When new characters showed up, it's like, what is she? Okay, she's a bishop or she's a queen, you know? It, it was like watching real-life chess pieces being moved around. It was really, really cool. Okay. Hey. Uh, five for me. I, I almost have no criticisms. Even things I thought were criticisms when I went back through my notes, I'm like, oh my god, they did set that up. Yep. <laughs> there, uh, like the the dawn throwing thing. I think might be the one thing I, I I couldn't remember them setting up, and they maybe even did when I didn't pay attention. Uh, it was really good storytelling. It was such a unique flavor for anime. Again, this is one I would show to people to be like, this is the potential anime has. Um, you know, we just came off Mob Psycho 2, and I feel like I've just been gushing about the shows I've been watching too much, but <laughs> this was a good one. So five for me. All right. So our next anime, the one we'll be talking about in two weeks, is Double Decker, Doug, and Kirill. Um, this is back from fall 2018. This is about a special crime organization uh, who sends out partners together. And one's a seasoned veteran, and one has weird mysterious powers is what i got from the description i don't almost know nothing about it this is jeremy's pick and we will give it a watch and a review and we will talk about it in two weeks that title just makes me think jeremy picked but anyway <laughs> i know right <laughs> i wanted to pick dodoro but it's only on episode seven yeah yeah okay um with that said if you have comments or corrections or your own thoughts on the anime we watched you can leave them on our twitter at baka podcast you can leave them at our email the anime baka club at gmail.com or you can leave us a comment wherever you found this podcast just fyi our mini so next week will be very less anime than it usually is we're going to be talking about avengers endgame because everyone's talking about avengers endgame even though not as much now but 
we just saw it. <laughs> we finally get to talk about it. So we're, we're just always gonna, at the party. We're just going to gush about it and, and pick it apart and do our thing with it. So we'll find ways to talk about anime too. And with that said, I think it's time for us to go. Thanks for listening. Om nom 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 nom. Sayonara. <laughs>